Welcome to another installment of the Utah Angler Lecture Series brought to you by Rocky Mountain Anglers and our generous partner Shields. Rocky Mountain Anglers is a local interest fishing club made up of avid anglers. Club meetings are held the second Tuesday of every month in the training rooms at Shields in Sandy, Utah. Club meetings are open to the public and we invite you to come learn and fish with us. Tonight's guest speaker, Roger Wilson, will focus on how to fish Strawberry Reservoir. Met Roger, he was the uh, aquatics leader in uh, the Division of Natural Resources and uh, did a lot to really uh, organize the department and keep it going on the schedule that it is going on. But the important thing for us about Roger is that prior to that, he was a project leader at, at Strawberry. And as a result of that, he is the one who is probably I, I won't say singly most responsible, but he is responsible for uh, the cleaning up of strawberry and the making of it into the fishery that it is. I served on the Blue Ribbon Fishery uh, Advisory Council for a number of years, and I think that we determined that at that time uh, that the strawberry was the crown jewel of the fishing spots that we have here in Utah. It produces a lot of fish, it has a lot of fish territory to fish, and uh, it's an excellent place to go. Roger has consented, to, he's been a hard guy to get here, but he's consented to speak to us, and I'm sure he will save some time for questions and answers. Let me introduce Roger Wilson and give the turn of time over to you, Roger. Well, thank you, Lee. I appreciate the opportunity to come and, and speak with you guys tonight and, and gals. I mean, that's uh, this is a great group. Uh, you know, uh, Jim did or uh, Lee didn't mention that I'm I'm retired now and I'm actually chairing the Anglers Coalition, which is an affiliation of a lot of different angler groups like this one. It's kind of an umbrella uh, uh, organization uh, that <clears throat> tries to coordinate the activities amongst the various groups and. Uh, you know, we've, we've been affiliated with uh, Rocky Mount for quite some time. I appreciate these guys. And I, from what I understand is uh, your club is moving and, and broadening your reach to other species, other waters. Uh, it was pretty much a, a walleye group, I think, at one time. I don't know, if, probably still primarily that, to, if I understand right. But, uh, uh, you know, that's great. Uh, I like fishing for walleye as well. But uh, we're going to talk today about, about strawberry. And as Lee mentioned, I, I managed strawberry back between the, uh, the treatment that occurred in 1990 and about uh, 2005, 2006, when I, I moved to the Salt Lake office. So I was there uh, something like 15 years, and, and uh, I really love the place. It's, uh, it's a wonderful water. And I might as well get into some of the slides here, if I can get this thing to work. <clears throat> you know, and... and uh, Lee kind of talked about it a little bit. Uh, strawberry is, is, is pretty unique uh, in Utah and in the West. It's uh, extremely productive water. Uh, it it uh, has had a, a history of producing large trout for many years. It was one of the first uh, reclamation project waters in, in the West. And so it's been impounded a long time. The original strawberry was uh, uh, created, uh, I think, in something like 1910, 1912. I think they started in 1910 and they finished the reservoir in 1912. So one of the first reclamation projects in the entire West. And it's always been, you know, uh, had this, uh, uh, been renowned for the, you know, the great fishing it has. I feel like, I'm, can, I, can I talk to this screen step? I feel like most of the people are over here. But uh, as, as Lee mentioned, strawberry is the most important cold water fishery in Utah. And I'd say it's probably the most important fishery. Lake Palace is pretty darn important, but a year in, year out, strawberry gets uh, probably more angry use. Uh, does anybody remember the chemical treatment project that occurred in 1990? Okay, that was uh, the largest uh, well known reclamation project ever attempted in the world, not just Utah, in the world, and it still stands for that. It, it, uh, it kind of absorbed the, the uh, I'm sorry, did I move away from your camera? You're fine, I got you. <laughs> 
Okay. It, uh, I forget, I got lost my train of thought there from that moment. But anyway, Rotten Home, the, the project in 1990 was the largest project ever attempted and it was highly successful. It, uh, uh, we, 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 uh, the target uh, was Utah Chubb and Utah Sucker and we did remove those fish. They, they came back pretty quick and we anticipated that and that's why a new uh, management plan was put in place. Uh, and I'll go into a lot of this. This is just kind of an overview. Uh, strawberry in 2006 was recognized as, as the best managed water in the United States. So, I mean, it, it has some renown nationally as well. It's, uh, it's a pretty important water. Um, and maybe these figures won't mean a lot to you guys, but uh, the reservoir sustains about 1.2 to 1.5 million angler hours a year, which is quite a, quite a lot of angling pressure. And Lake Powell is pretty close in some years, but not, not all years. And the thing that's really amazing is this water gets 100 hours per acre per year, which is off the charts. I mean, there's no water in the West or uh, probably the West that compares to that. It's a lot of use. And it gets a lot of use because it's a pretty popular place. Um, one thing that's, that's really uh, come to be is the the large cutthroat trout that are protected by the slot limit that was implemented in, in 2003, uh, they are effectively controlling the invasive Utah chubs. And Utah chubs is a, it's a minnow fish uh, and they get so abundant they tie up all the food resources so they're, they're really a problem. And, and you know, sometimes anglers don't recognize how important that is. That is a big deal. We spent uh, 50 years, probably 70 years, treating waters with rope on Schofield and Panguitch Lake and Strawberry and, and any number of waters to eliminate the Utah Chubb so we could restock with Rainbow. And Strawberry was so big that we couldn't do that. We knew that, that treatment was probably the last one we'd ever have. So so we, we implemented that cutthroat program and with the slot protection, they have controlled the Chubb, which is pretty cool. Um, you know, and, and Lee and I were talking earlier about this, uh, fishing is probably strawberry as good as it's ever been. You hear a lot of the old guys, well maybe a lot of those guys have passed on, but but uh, they talk about the early years and how great it was and how wonderful fishing was, but you look at the data, <laughs> it's better now. I mean, they're catching more fish, there's more pressure, and they're bigger fish, so it really is better now. It is the good old day. and and you know, I, I hear a lot of, does anybody fish Henry's Lake in this, this party here? Anybody ever go up there? Okay, well, you know, I used to hear a lot, guys that say, well, strawberry's great, but it's not Henry's Lake. <laughs> and on every metric that we have, strawberry outperforms Henry's Lake. It has a higher catch rate, a larger average fish, and, and uh, it has greater fishing pressure. So it really is better than Henry's Lake. And you know, Lee said, don't do a lot of data. I, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> you know, I, I got this information from, let's see if I can get the pointer. You know, this is the guy that's managing it now, Alan Ward. And he's doing a great job, and, and I just want to recognize him. This is his data, but just some real quick information here. If you look, this is the, the catch rates at Strawberry. Uh, over, well, since 1996 to 2021, you can see that there's been a little fluctuation in that, but we have a general, upwards trend in the in the catch rate. Let's see if I can make this work. So, you know, fishing is is improving, even since 1996. And you can see the different color bars as the uh, the different species. So one thing I wanted to point out is that the early years, the, you didn't see many of the kokanee showing up. You know, and, and we were kind of concerned about that. We didn't uh, see them uh, for the first, you know, well, we saw them, but they didn't really impact the fishery to any great degree until we hit about 2010, 2011. They started to show up. And now kokanee are pretty important. I don't, does anybody fish kokanee at strawberry in this group? Okay. Kokanee are, are really highly sought after now. We'll go into that in a minute here, but just so you, you recognize that uh, fishing is actually, uh, the catch rates are going up. This is a summer catch rate, July only. And you can see how the, the kokanee wow. were not showing up in the summers until we hit, you know, may, maybe about 2015. And now we see that kokanee comprise a major component of the catch in, in the summer. So, you know, it's a lot different than it was there. They are a very important species for us. And if I say us, uh, I, I don't work for the Division of Wildlife anymore, but I, I can't help it. <laughs> I still say us and we. <clears throat> 
Okay, this is kind of the, the long-term angling pressure history here. You can see this, well, we start, this is 1947, and you can see the pressure was way lower back in those days. And part of that was strawberry was smaller. It wasn't enlarged to the, the larger reservoir until the, until the mid 80s. So it's much larger, but we also get a lot of, uh, a lot more fishing pressure. And you can see that, uh, you know, the pressure has had a steady increase over the years. And this, this line here is kind of an average, I think Alan was showing since 1996. So we're, we're just under 1.2 million hours, which was the objective for the reservoir. So, uh, on the average, but you can see that we've gone above uh, 1.4 too. So a lot of pressure up there and it's increased over time. And, and this is one of the problems I'm going to discuss too, because Utah's population is growing and we're, we're having recreational development up strawberry. We're having improvement in roads. Uh, guys can get up there from Richfield now without going through Provo. So we're, we're going to see a, an increase in, in pressure up there. Okay. This is the, annual total catch rate since 47. And again, you can see that catch rate is take that, taking that general trend upwards. And this is the average again, I believe, which is about uh, 0.55. And the objective for strawberry is 0.5 fish per hour. So it's at or, or exceeds objective there. And that might not sound like a very good catch rate to the better fisherman in the group. I mean, if you're just catching a half a fish an hour of strawberry, then you're not very happy, but <laughs> but this is averaged over all angler groups and and you know shore anglers and everything. So a half a fish an hour is actually a pretty good rate, but I wouldn't be satisfied with that. <laughs> I'll bet many you wouldn't either. How do you explain the extreme dips? Okay, well, that part, part of this you can't explain. You know this one here. See this dip from here to there. Yeah, yeah. That was when the chubs came on. Oh. And so anglers start to stay away from strawberry. You know I saw. We used to joke that all the boats that used to go to Strawberry every summer were parked in Salt Lake for about 10 years because they weren't using them anymore. Because uh, those guys would only fish Strawberry. <laughs> so that, that was one of the, the dip. Uh, let's see, I can't, there it goes. This dip, I'm trying to see what year that is. That's 96, 90. Okay, th I think that second dip, that one right there, uh, you know, we, we treated 1990 and we, we didn't have a lot of fish to restock with. And at the time, the marina operator wasn't happy with the closure, which would have been the best thing to do because that would allow the fishery to establish. And, and what happened is we put the fish in there and they declined rapidly because they were harvested. <laughs> so that was, uh, the uh, fishing success kind of declined during that time and so did pressure. So that was because we weren't able to close the water, which we should have, should have probably done. And then another one, I don't know what this, uh, Maybe ask Alan about this, this dip here, but that's that's a pretty good dip. What is that? Sixteen. Yeah. We did have uh, during those during that year we had a decline in the cutthroat, and part of that was due to predation, and we've had to work around that by stocking bigger fish, because you know that we we were successful in getting the cutthroat big and turning into predators, and you know what that means. <laughs> they eat your small fish that you stock too. So I think that that's what happened that that time. But again, Alan would probably have a better answer. <laughs> okay, uh, you know, and I, I hear from guys sometimes that, that uh, why you why didn't you close why don't you close strawberry during the winter? You know, why not close it and have opening day? A lot of guys like the opening day, the old timer. You know, they like to go and have the, the social interaction there on opening day. But uh, they complain to me a lot about why are you letting those guys catch all those fish during the winter. <laughs> and if you look at this, this. Uh, there we go. The average number of, of angler hours in the entire winter is 187,000. During the summer, during one month in the summer, you get 250 to 300,000 hours in one month. So this is not much. And it's, uh, so basically ice fishing pressure is about 15% of the, the annual uh, fishing pressure. And they harvest about 8% of the, of the annual harvest. So it, it's, uh, it, it's not really that significant. Okay, that's enough of the data then. Uh, Lee asked me to kind of talk about, uh, am I in your way over there? I guess you can kind of see my pointers, I guess, but um, he wanted to talk about strawberry and the, you know, the lay of the land up there and, and kind of how it's, how it's set up. And, and this is, uh, these are the zones in strawberry. Okay, this one, here's the old reservoir. 
is traced about in that area. The original dam was right there. You gotta be pretty steady handed on this thing. <laughs> um, so that was the original reservoir. They came and they built the Soldier Creek Dam, which is right, right there in, you remember that was at least 72, 73, something like that. And they built that dam. And what they did is they, they impounded water until it filled up all through the narrows and up against the strawberry dam. And then they breached the strawberry dam when they got about the same water. And that occurred in, uh, I believe, about, uh, uh, it was in the 80s, early 80s. But anyway, that's the old strawberry arm here. This one is a new part of the, the new reservoir. That's the Meadows or Indian Creek. Some people call it Renegade. And the reason they do the Renegade boat ramp is right there, right there. And that new road coming up from Spanish Fork Canyon uh, comes right to, to that Indian Creek Bay there. <laughs> so it's really accessible now to that other side. The Narrows, of course, is this, uh, the narrow reach, and that includes the, this is the old strawberry channel here. And this one here is the Indian Creek channel there. And it was the Strawberry River from here on down through the Narrows. And then this is the Soldier Creek part of the reservoir down here. And as I pointed out, the, there's the dam. Now, just uh, real quickly, the, I'll point out the marinas. The, the Strawberry Marina sits right there. The, Indi the uh, Renegade Marina is there, it's a boat ramp. Uh, Aspen boat ramp is there. And the, the Soldier Creek Marina is right there. They have been undertaking another boat ramp development that's going to, no, I can't make it move. There we go. It's going to be placed up in here in Jake's Bay. That's going to be the next few years, they'll have a new boat ramp there. It's not, I don't think it'll be supported by a marina store or one. It'll just be a boat ramp, but, but uh, it'll be a smaller one. But that'll be kind of nice to have something on the north end of the reservoir. Yeah. I've, I've fished that with small boats before, and the winds have kept me from getting back to strawberry. <laughs> and I had to sit there and wait wait all day to, for the winds to die down. So it, it'll be nice to have a ramp up there. Any questions about that, the lay of the land there? Oh, I didn't point out the, there used to be a dike right here, and that held the water in the strawberry arm because they, they impounded water and it would have spilled over into Indian Creek, so they had a dike there. And they did all sorts of water management. They brought water from Chipman and Indian Creek around in the canal and they dumped them into strawberry. There were other dikes around the reservoir, but they, they did uh, a lot of work to get water in there. Anyway. So is the Soldier Creek Dam the one that uh, it, it's, uh, is the barrier to yes. the water? Yes, that's what's holding the water for the whole thing now. Okay, so that's the only... Yeah, you can't even see the Strawberry Dam anymore. At lower water levels, you can see where they breached it. Uh -huh. And if you get your, your fish finders out, you can find the old dike. They, they breach the dike too, but you can still see segments of that if you on your fish finders. You can also see the the old dam if you if you look closely there. And if you if you look at as you go through the this is a new map here, but if you, here's where you go through into the narrows. This gives you a different perspective. The other one didn't didn't lay the size very well. This is kind of an overhead shot, so you can see how much larger the you know the strawberry segment is than the rest of it. But uh, you know and there's the. There's the narrows where the dam was. If you look as you drive through the narrows there, or go through the narrows there, you can see some of the old borrow pits where they used to build that dam, if you look close. It's on that uh, north, or that, yeah, that north abutment there. Anyway, uh, going a little further into the, the lay of the location, this is some of the different areas. Uh, you know, as I pointed out before, this bay up here, Chicken Creek East or Jake's Bay. This is, the, and you know, there's some pretty good fishing in there at times, rainbow fishing. This is the Strawberry Bay, what we call Strawberry Bay. The Strawberry River comes in right here. Uh, Mud Creek Bay. This is uh, what's called Bryce Fork or East Portal Bay. You know, the water comes in from the Central Utah Project in a place called the Ladders. You know, there's a, there's a big portal there. You've probably seen that by the highway. And it goes out under the water, under the reservoir, and comes down into Spanish Fork Canyon this way, or, or Diamond Fork Canyon that way. That's why they call it uh, East Portal Bay, because East Portal for the tunnel that goes through to the west. Um, this is Hawes Point. That's a really uh, common and, and popular uh, shore fishing area. Uh, Strawberry isn't really well known for shore fishing. It's uh, it doesn't have a lot of access points for shore fishing. It's uh, it's never been a very good shore fishery. 
Schofield, Panguitch Lake are much better. And, you know, I, I don't know exactly why. It's probably the, the, the way the, the bottom profile is, but, but strawberry has never been the, the best shore fishing water. It's good at times. You know, the spring and fall uh, is pretty good, and sometimes in the summer, the, you know, the bait guys get rainbows, but, uh, but it's, it's really better if you can float. <laughs> it's, it's a lot, and even when you're fishing on the shore, it's better if you cast into shore and bring it back than it is casting from shore. Okay, and moving down to the reservoir, this is, a, again, the, the uh, Indian Creek or, or a Renegade Meadows area. This is Horse, Horse Creek there, and this is where the Indian Creek comes in, Indian Creek Bay. There's some really good fishing here in Shipman Bay. I've done very well there. You know, and, and I haven't fished the Narrows for a long time, but I've, in the past I used to catch quite a few kokanee in the Narrows. And that doesn't seem to be the case lately. I don't know why. Okay, and then Soldier Creek. Uh, uh, this is much deeper on this end of the reservoir, obviously, where the dam is. Uh, Meadows is, is fairly shallow. And portions of strawberry are pretty shallow too, but shallow water is pretty good for producing fish, so don't shy away from shallow water. Any questions about that? Okay, just uh, what time is it, Lee? How much? I don't know Right now it's about 7.24. Okay, we're good then. Okay, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the three management species up there and, and uh, you know, why we're managing strawberry with these species and, and, uh, and how to catch them. First, we'll start out with the cutthroat, okay? In the, in the past, uh, you know, the distant past, strawberry was managed with the Yellowstone cutthroat. Uh, in the old days, the, the, many of the western states went to Yellowstone to get their eggs. And so we ended up with a lot of Yellowstone cutthroat. Uh, we called them strawberry cutthroat because they were a little bit hybridized with rainbow. and. And we use the, the fish in strawberry. We use the fish trap on the Strawberry River to supply all of the cutthroat eggs for the whole state. This was prior to the treatment. You know, this is strawberry was the major egg supplier for for the state for for cutthroat. And uh, during the treatment, what happened? Uh, the chubs came on in the late seventies. The, there was a treatment. I better back up a little bit. There was a treatment in in sixty. Strikes me 61 somewhere in there, and we had a really good fishery until the chubs came back, and they came back in the late 70s and, and came back with a vengeance in the 80s and collapsed the fishery. You know, here we have the the most pr productive water, cold water fishery in Utah, and the rainbow trout we were stocking in there in the 80s were starving to death. I'm serious, they were starving to death. They couldn't find anything to eat because <laughs> the chubs got all the feed, and that's just the nature of rainbow. The, other species do a little bit better, and I'll talk about that. But uh, during that period of time, we experimented with Bear Lake cutthroat trout. Uh, these cutthroat are from, of course, Bear Lake, and they're, uh, they're piscivorous cutthroat, which means they eat fish. And we wanted them, to, we wanted to experiment with them and see how they do in strawberry with the, with the, you know, the chubs. And they did very well. We put them in there in the 80s, and, and they performed well. They survived, and they, they had full mm -hmm. stomachs, uh, contrary to what the rainbows did. So they performed better than the rainbows. And, you know, we had a lot, a lot of battles with the anglers when we implemented the new program because they wanted rainbows. <laughs> and everybody likes rainbows. They're great fish. But the, the bottom line is rainbows would not have sustained the fishery forever in strawberry if we'd gone with them, you know, totally. So during the post-treatment, after the 1990 chemical treatment, cutthroat became the focus of our management plan because of how they performed in the lake. And as I mentioned in that introductory slide, that with slot limit protection, they have shown their effectiveness in, in controlling Utah chubs. And it was almost immediate. We implemented the, the slot limit, which protects everything from 15 to 24 in the cutthroat group. And it, it allowed those fish to grow through the slot, get large, and turn into fish eaters. And, and that was really hard. That first couple of years, we implemented that thing. I mean, we had guys going up there and catching a lot of cutthroat. And they couldn't keep them. Because <laughs> we didn't have any large fish yet. And uh, I mean, they could have kept under 15, but that's not the nature of strawberry. People want to keep big fish. And, and uh, there was a little bit, I mean, there was some pushback, you know, that we can't keep any fish. And besides that, if we wound them and we know they're going to die, we watch them die behind the boat, we can't keep them. <laughs> See, we, we had to make it so 
you know, if the guy, if we let people keep injured fish, then they'd make sure the fish was injured. <laughs> so they can haul it home. So we had to implement a, a, a no take between 15 and 20, 22. We had to do that. So there, there was a little bit of some hardship there for the first few years. But, uh, and as I mentioned, a lot of the anglers were hesitant to accept cutthroat as, as the fish they wanted in that reservoir. I think that we turned the corner on that, and I think the anglers are pretty happy with you know, the longevity of the fishery now, the fact that we're not having to treat it, the fact it's not collapsing, and, and they, they kind of like catching cutthroat. Now, I'm not going to you know, blow any air up your skirt. They're, they don't fight like rainbows. Rainbows are great fighters. They, they hit the bait, and they run on you. And uh, cutthroat don't do that. They, me and, G, and uh, Lee were talking about this at the start. I mean, they, cutthroat tend to hit, and they don't fight real hard until they see the boat. But I, you know, I think they're still a lot of fun when they see the boat or the float tube because they, they put a pretty good fight then. Any questions about cutthroat? And why we went with cutthroat? Okay. Just some uh, quick and dirty, uh, you know, guidelines for catching cutthroat. Uh, you know, cutthroat can be taken with almost anything. Um, I, I've used most of these things, and they all work. I think uh, the key with the bigger cutthroat is using something that imitates a, a fish. And I think tube jigs are probably the, the thing that I use most of all for cutthroat. I mean, they, they work in the winter, they work in the summer in some circumstances, they work in spring and fall. But, uh, you know, any of the crankbaits would work. You know, the, the pointer minnows are really good if you've got lots of money in your pocket. <laughs> they're, they're very good. But, uh, you know, and, and some of the even some of the the bass baits you know the single tail grubs work pretty well too I, i've had good luck with them the, the swim baits a lot of guys uh, really swear on the swim baits up there but they're almost like fishing for bass <laughs> the, the guys that they're good bass fishermen do pretty well with these cutthroat but anyway ice let's go on to season fishing a little bit cutthroat to, uh, again they can be taken a variety of depths i i've fished ice fish and strawberry and caught Cutthroat trout at five feet, total five feet in depth. You know, you have a foot of ice and you have, or two feet of ice, and you have just a little bit of water. I've caught them there. I've caught them in deeper water. I've caught them in shallow water, so they're 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 pretty easy to catch. And, and uh, I, I generally use paddle bugs or tube jigs again. And, and uh, whites and chartreuses seem to be the best colors for me, anyway. Um, and again, let me let me make that caveat too. These are kind of some of the things I use. You know, it's not like these are the only things you can do. Because there's a lot of stuff that works. Spring and fall, as I mentioned, uh, bassing for trout in shallow water is uh, it's a kick. I mean, the, the cutthroat move in there in the fall when the water cools down, and they're after chubs. They prefer chubs, even though they will eat trout. They prefer chubs. I've seen that. They 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 uh, co-evolve with chubs in in the Great Basin, so they they like to eat chubs, and. Uh, they're, they're very effective uh, spring and fall with the, the bass techniques. Okay, summer, uh, obviously the cutthroat are t tend to be in deeper water, and so they're, they're taken with uh, deeper water techniques with downriggers or leaded lines, but if you fish the right time of day, they can be taken near shore. I've, I've been you know, on the shore with the, with the barge. We used to stock fish with the barge. We'd load them in the bars and haul them off and stock them at various locations around the reservoir. So I'd have a little time waiting for the trucks to come, and I'd watch the cutthroat feed. In the middle of the summer, water was 20 degrees centigrade, which was about 68, pretty warm. And they would be in there working the, the shiners. You'd see, you know, they work together, and they push the shiners right up on the shore. They'd flop out of the water on the shore. So they're, they're, in, the shallow, they're in the shallow water even in the summer. So some of those techniques can work then. Okay, rainbow trout. Uh, I've kind of gone into some of this. Uh, <clears throat> Rainbow have been a critical part of strawberry for uh, many years, more than 100 years, and, and uh, <clears throat> they, uh, they're very popular fish. They're not the focus of the, the management plan now because they, they don't compete well with the chubs, and, but they are still part of the, part of the management plan, and <clears throat> I'm kind of losing my voice here. <clears throat> The, the role of rainbow is to provide a harvest uh, fish for, for anglers to catch and keep. You know, because there's a, a fairly stringent regulation on the cutthroat, we want rainbow in there for, for guys to keep. And let's see. We did one other thing that I, I have mentioned is the rainbow trout are sterilizing strawberry. 
because rainbow and cutthroat hybridize fairly readily and, and we didn't want to lose those desirable management attributes in the cutthroat so we wanted to prevent that that hybridization and and really uh, the the states i think recently gone to most areas of the state are stocked with with uh, sterile rainbows anyway because it, it's just a, just good management practice okay tips for catching rainbows rainbows are similar to cutthroat they can be taken by a, a, with a number of techniques I don't know why it is but they seem to prefer the soldier creek side of the reservoir they we'd stock them all over the reservoir and, and they move into soldier creek <laughs> so we kind of quit trying to beat them and stock more in soldier creek I don't know if they're doing that still but uh, I guess you're looking at that big boy over there huh <laughs> but uh, soldier creek tends to really attract the rainbows uh, sometimes they're taken with uh, deeper water uh, techniques but most often they're found in shallow waters uh, you know rainbows like waters uh, 15 feet and less very often they they like they're affiliated with the weed beds a lot and uh, i found that fishing in the bays and off points is really pretty good and uh, one, one technique that a lot of guys use is they just uh, they don't wait it at all they just put a worm on a hook and drift and that works really good for rainbows even out in the open water areas and you guys probably know this but uh, <laughs> rainbows really like crayfish <laughs> so anything that would imitate a crayfish i think would work for for rainbows and we you know i looked at uh, thousands of stomachs up there and, and rainbows had a lot of crayfish in them very few fish you know guys will tell me well, rainbows eat fish too but very few they're just not the predator the cutthroat are not even close so that's that's another reason we didn't go with them Okay, kokanee, and you guys are probably more interested in this than the other fish, okay? They were, like cutthroat trout, they were introduced to strawberry during the, the uh, 1980s to see how they did in the high chub situation, and, and they did great. They, they found food, uh, the rainbows were starving, but the, the kokanee found plenty to eat, and they grew well. And so they were chosen for, uh, you know, to the new management approach to strawberry, they were chosen to be part of that. It, it uh, was a little bit disheartening there, uh, you know, after the treatment, uh, the kokanee took a while to develop. We saw some years where they came on pretty strong. We had good spawning runs and, and fairly good catches, but uh, it just didn't seem consistent. And it took them about 15 years to really take hold. And, and they're, they've taken hold now. They're, they're doing very well. Um, and it, you guys probably know kokanee are highly sought by anglers. They're, they have great uh, sport fish qualities, they're hard fighters, they, they're great table qualities. I, I might uh, get stoned here, but I think they're as good at eating as walleye are. <laughs> I love kokanee, so. Um, <laughs> any debate? <laughs> Smoke kokanee. <laughs> Pretty good, huh? Okay, so one thing that, that is kind of interesting about kokanee is with the develop with the population there and our fish trap that we have on Strawberry River, it's a great place to take eggs. And, and we take, uh, they take two to 3.5 million eggs a year. And, and this trap has been instrumental in, in, in uh, supplementing Flaming Gorge and also providing fish to stock in some of these other waters. Uh, you probably heard that, that uh, you know, kokanee are now, whoops, who's the wrong button? Eggs. You know, we uh, Flaming Gorge, they've been used to, to supplement and they've been introduced into a number of lakes in Utah. And these fish came from, uh, the eggs came from strawberries, so it's been instrumental in expanding the range. Yes? Where was the original kokanee South Bend from? Well, the, there's two strains of kokanee uh, in the West. There's a, a, one out of Kootenay, and that's a, a big river. It's uh, in British Columbia. The early spawning fish all came from Kootenay, from eggs from Kootenay from years ago. The uh, later spawning variety, they spawn, well, the early spawn spawns in September at Strawberry, and, and the few that we have left of the later spawn spawn in November. And those fish came out of uh, Flathead Lake in Montana originally. And, uh, you know, through Colorado, Colorado had a lot of those fish in, in Granby and uh, a place called Roaring Judy. I, that, that must have a story behind it. <laughs> There's a Roaring Judy hatchery there, and, and, and I believe that's on Blue Mesa Reservoir. And so the later spawning fish have come out of Colorado primarily in Utah. But uh, the, the main interest. Uh, 
Is what? Can you tell the difference between the two? Well, typically the early spawning fish are more colorful. This is that's an early spawning kokanee. The later spawning are darker. They're they're almost black. I mean, they, they have a little bit of red in them, and they they tend to, you know, they're they're kind of multicolored. They're they're red on the back. They have a black band and they have the more white on the belt. So they're a lot of times we see them in the trap early on with the with the other group and they just are still firm. The eggs are not ready for taking, so they, they typically come on just a little later. But the, the one nice thing about that later spawning kokanee, they tend to spawn in the lake too, and that's the one of interest at Flaming Gorge because there's so much habitat in the lake, and we haven't verified much if any in strawberry, but there's a lot of uh, spotted and kokanee in the lake up there, and that's the later fish. So there's a, a great interest in that lake, lake fish. I um, guess we can move on here. Okay, tips for catching kokanee. Uh, have we still got time? Lee? Okay. Um, Okay, I will. All the time you want on Okay. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Well, again, kokanee are great. They're super fish. Guys are very interested in kokanee, but you have to specialize. You can't just go out there with your standard rainbow techniques. That won't work. Kokanee are, you know, it, it isn't that complicated. You just need to specialize. And. Another thing about kokanee, they're only taking, you know, there's there's a few taken through the ice. And uh, I've talked to some guys who have done that, you know, around the reservoir this year, but not very many. Most of the kokanee are taken during the spring and summer. And during the early establishment of the kokanee population, they, it was July through August. So it was about six weeks is all we had of kokanee fishing. That's probably why it didn't develop. But right now they start in May. So, you know, you need to be geared up with all your kokanee stuff in, in May, ready to go as soon as the ice comes off if you want to catch the early 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 fish. Um, there, even though there is a specialized technique that's fairly straightforward, and I'm, I'm going to talk about terminal baits here first, but uh, it, it's really fairly easy. The, the thing that works the best is a pink or silver dodger, sometimes green, a short length of leader. That's very important. A foot, foot and a half a liter, not very much. Because you need the dodger to give the squid action. You know, a lot of guys will put the long one on, that's short. And you know how the dodgers do, they kind of do this in the water, and that gives the squid a little bit, opens the tentacles up a little bit. And then, of course, I mentioned you you, you tip with it, or you uh, your terminal equipment is a, a squid, uh, usually a pink or a green one. And you got to sand them a little bit, and, and you know everybody has their, their favorite scent. You know, carp spitworts, um, gold maggots. I really like because they stay on the hook even after coconut are caught. I really like those, and and they're persistent, and they, they keep their smell in the water for a long time. So I think you're trying to uh, you know get that smell going there. And in the early years, uh, most of the guys used the needle or uh, needle fish, you know, green needle fish or little ones. No, not very big, and and uh, <clears throat> the wedding rings. Anybody ever used a wedding ring up there? Oh, Have you still caught kokanee that way? Or yeah. I think they still work, but most of the guys now are using the, the squids, and uh, it, it seems to be a pretty good technique. <clears throat> Any other techniques guys want to lay on the group here? I've never got a hold of them, but supposedly they've got some yeah. shrimp out now that yeah. oh. people are using shrimp. Are they small shrimp or are they? Yeah, they're just little shrimp. Hmm. Same size as the squid and shrimp shape. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, I've used those. I've used squid like those or uh, um, shrimp like those, and through the ice sometimes they've been very effective for other things. It's probably the same thing. You just go to the butcher shop and you buy the little shrimp. But uh, where do you get your shrimp? I, I haven't been able to find it. Just go to the butcher shop. You can get little ones. At least I use them through the ice a little bit. They sure stink everything up though. You put them in your ice bucket and it smells like that for forever, I think. So, you know, you know, artificial ones. They love those artificial ones. Yeah. Yep. You get them online. Pink and cotton candy colors. I'm always amazed at the ingenuity of anglers. You know, and I, I, it's just amazing what they come up with. You know, spraying WD 40 on a worm. I mean, where do you get that from? 
You know, all I can say is they have all day in the boat to think up this stuff. Because <laughs> they come up with the darndest things sometimes. And, uh, you know, it seems like the fish change too, so you almost have to adapt with them. But, uh, you know, the, the last uh, few years that you know, squids have been really good. Okay. Um, and you guys probably know this. Determine the location, the depth of school is the most important thing. You got to find them. They're not spread around the reservoir. They're localized, and they are in certain areas uh, typically that you should try. But <laughs> the best thing to do is go out there during kokanee season and look to where the boats are, because <laughs> <laughs> yep. that's where the kokanee will be. And and they, there's a little bit of a following. They get on the radios and they tell each other. They talk it up, and so you know it's kind of good to watch the boats and see where they're going. It doesn't always work, but. Uh, you know, coconut are typically found in deeper water in the summer. They they, they do a, what's called a DL migration. They come up and at night and, and feed, and then they go down, and they inhabit that lower uh, strata during the day. And really, you probably understood this, but coconut aren't really feeding when they hit your baits. Uh, really, the, the trick is you're, you're kind of you're ticking them off. you gotta, you got to piss them off <laughs> to get them to strike. They're not really feeding on that. So coconut. 99% of what they eat is, is zooplankton, which are a millimeter. They're little guys. I, I don't think you can put that on a hook. But, <laughs> but they're they're not really feeding. You're, they're, you're listening to strike. They're, they're in a school, and they're probably protecting the school somewhat, you know. You just got to make them mad, kind of. And there's a lot of ways to do that, you know. The, the stuff you use, you make them think it's fish that's maybe invading the school. But they're found in that deeper water, and I've seen both techniques with downriggers and lead line working really well. In fact, some days I've seen guys that give up their downriggers and go to lead lines because they're not catching them with downriggers, and they are on the leaded. And I don't know what that, what the deal is with that. A lot of guys will do both. So, and I don't know how they do it. They rig. I, I, I don't want to be mess with it. They, they rig down the downrigger line. You know, they have three or four depths that they rig at. And that seems too complicated to me. <laughs> seems to me like you'd be all snarled up. But it, apparently they, they figured out a way to do it. Does any of you guys do that? Does it, uh, do, you, do you kind of move to certain depths once they start hitting, or are they hitting on all three? Or? Usually just do it to find them first. I'm sorry, what? Usually do it to find them first. So if, yeah. you, if you're halfway, you can get those ones that will go halfway down and stop. And then you focus on that depth. Then okay. focus on that depth. Because after that, so it's usually not worth the line management. No. Well, that's that's my point. I mean, it, it seems like even with just two downriggers out in a boat, and the way Kokanee fight, they're wrapping you up all over the place anyway. So yeah. it's just they're they're something. <laughs> they they really get mad when they get caught. Put the they, bottom line out farther. I'm sorry, what? You put the bottom line out farther. Yeah, that's a good idea. Pretty pretty good on that. Did you pull your other lines in when you get hook one out that far? Or? It hits the bottom one. We generally just caught them that quick. Yeah. All right, well, um, I've even taken a few from the surface. Uh, are you guys taking any? I mean, I've been deploying my downrigger and I got my line out and they hit. So, I mean, they're not always deep either. And, you know, the fish finders, you, you know, you really don't see them at the surface, but sometimes they're there. Um, and there are certainly areas that consistently produce coconut. And that's kind of what this next. Uh, you know, Alan Ward actually created this for me. I, I need to give him credit for this. But, you know, these are kind of some of the areas where we see kokanee a lot. You know, they, they tend to be right around the corner from the Strawberry Marina and then up north in this in this general area. What I like to do a lot is I, I kind of focus in on that point off Mud Creek. I lost my pointer. And this this is this is Bear Hole right here. No, I'm sorry. Bear Hole right. That's Sage Creek. Bear Holes is probably not showing up. It's about right here. So I kind of angle like that when I when I fish the strawberry arm. I, I haven't fished, uh, you know, the meadows very much for kokanee, but uh, I, I hear guys taking them down there. Um, Soldier Creek is also, there's a couple of spots out there, you know, this this really steep, you guys know how steep the shoreline is here off the road. I mean, it, there tends to be a body of kokanee in there, and then right at the mouth of where the narrows comes into Soldier Creek. Those are not the only areas to catch them, but they're they're certainly pretty good ones. Does anybody? I mean, and I do. Uh, before I go there, I, I've caught a, quite a few further up in here by the knolls too. If you stay in the deeper water, anybody else have any input that they care to share, or is it a 
Guarded secret. <laughs> <laughs> rainbow fishing over there on those steep banks on the Sony Creek side, too. Yep. Right along the head. Are you trolling there against the shore right there? Yep. Anyway, that's uh, that's all I had on, on fishing. And, and, you know, Lee told me not to go into too much detail. You're going to have somebody come and talk later. So I just wanted to hit the high points. But uh, I'm just going to close with kind of a, a future management challenges up strawberry some of the things that that i see and and we see is is the difficulties down the road and and as i mentioned a lot of these difficulties have to do with people and too many people and uh, <laughs> you know we utah's growth is is uh, progressing and it's not not slowing down uh during the you know we, we had a, we saw a covid uh, bump in fishing license sales when we had covid everybody went and bought licenses that has dropped a little bit but it's still, uh, you know, we're still selling 500 to 600,000 fishing licenses, which is quite a bit. I mean, I, I can't think of another interest group in Utah that's 600,000 people. <laughs> you know, so it, it's, it's a lot of people, but uh, there's also the, the new road coming into the reservoir that's going to bring more. Um, there's recreational developments, both, both proposed and ongoing, that are going to bring people uh, to the reservoir. You know, and I don't have to tell you that. You know, we've had a lot of problems with uh, with drought. You know, the, the climate's changed. We got we got more drought conditions in the West, and these are affecting both the quality and quantity of water. Strawberry's a little bit uh, immune from the water problems. So we had a tour. We brought some guys from Southern Utah one time. We're looking at strawberry, and <laughs> they were saying, "There's no drought up here. You got lots of water." Because strawberry fluctuates more in the long term program it doesn't have the annual fluctuation and luckily that's the case I mean we keep water in strawberry it'll have to be a pretty severe drought before we don't see water up there but but there are there are situations where uh, water quality is an issue strawberry was on the impaired water list for a few years and there was a TMDL study that was done up there to try to decide how to how to keep phosphorus out of there a little bit too much phosphorus in there and it's great for producing fish but it also creates conditions where fish may not survive the winter or even the summer so you know we got to keep the, the water quality in there pretty good too you know and, and the division of wildlife has finite resources for stocking fish for management and, and uh, you know hopefully uh, more people coming and fishing there's more licenses sold but you know very very serious problem potentially in the future you know and uh, aquatic invasive species are always a threat throughout utah and certainly a threat to strawberry uh, we don't want any of those uh, those uh, Quagga mussels or zebra mussels in strawberry, that would be, could be pretty bad, especially uh, quagga, because they can take cold water. Um, and, you know, I, I had to end with this one. Uh, you know, we still are very concerned about illegal fish introduction. You know, that uh, in some cases has, has collapsed fisheries if, if they bring in the wrong fish. And, and uh, we want to make sure that everybody's uh, aware that that is not a good thing to do. You know, we need to. If someone wants another fish in strawberry, we need to go through a process. And uh, we've discovered uh, we discovered smallmouth bass in there in uh, oh, it was early 2000s. We, we netted some, and I could see hooking scar on them. <laughs> so they've been recently put in there. But uh, smallmouth, uh, you know, I, I love smallmouth too. But strawberry is not the place for smallmouth. It, uh, it it's too high, too cold. Smallmouth the uh, don't get to a sufficient size to survive what's called the starvation period, which is the overwinter period. It's too lengthy in strawberry. And we've never seen evidence of, of recruitment up there of smallmouth, even with some illegal fish going in there. So smallmouth aren't going to make it. So it's really a waste. I've had reports of, uh, of, of walleye being in there, which probably isn't the best idea right now. You know, there is a, uh, does anybody fish Schofield in this group at all? You know, Schofield's kind of taken a, a different approach. They they went to the biological control, which we did after the treatment of strawberry at the cutthroat, and, and they stocked a lot of predators in there. They've got uh, uh, tiger muskies and walleye, sterile walleye, and uh, of course tiger trout and wipers. <laughs> so they're trying to get the chubs through predation, and that seems to be working. So there's uh, there's other tools out there that, that can work, but you know the. I, I used to have a lot of guys talk to me about strawberry. Why can't we have tiger trout in there or splake? Why can't we put all the rest of this stuff in there? 
the key point is, is you know, we have so many pounds that we can deliver to strawberry. And if we pull, or if we put something else in, we got to pull something. Because mm -hmm. you can't just get all the fish you want in strawberry. You got to, so we'd have to give up rainbows or cutthroat to put splake in there. Mm -hmm. So it's probably not a good idea. What's, what we got there is working, and, and we probably shouldn't tamper with it too much, the way I look at it. Anyway, that's, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Are there any questions? Do you know, going back to coconut, so I don't know, you approximately put in 500,000? The, the long term year. stocking quota was about 400,000. 400? I don't know if it's still the same, but that's what was stocked there. So have you ever done, you put in 400 in three years when they, or whatever, three or four years when they come around again? How, what's their survival rate? I mean, or how many is going up the streams? I mean, or basically. Well, the, during the initial period, survival rate was excellent. I used to joke that every fish survived. Because, <laughs> you know, for the few we put in there, we had a pretty good return on them. Uh, right now, uh, well, I don't know about right now, but when I was there, roughly, well, roughly 50% of the kokanee that ran up Mr. Well, let's put it this way: 50% of the kokanee that we sampled were produced naturally, so they were spawned in the streams and swam down as as uh, swim up fry into the reservoir. And uh, I think it's anywhere between 40 and 60 on a general uh, basis. But uh, so you know, there's a lot of re recruitment that goes into the kokanee population up there. And I don't know what it is now, but that's that's a real significant thing. And we wanted that all along. We wanted to maximize I didn't really mention much about that but cutthroat and kokanee recruitment we wanted to get as much natural reproduction as we could don't you think that's helped a lot by the work that you've done on the strawberry river? yes yep yeah that uh, we spent a lot of money well uh, there was an EPA grant to do some of that work but there's been a lot of money spent over the years on restoration work in strawberry valley some of the early work didn't do very much because uh, you know we're still learning but uh, it, it's uh, it's really you know and the cutthroat there there's a significant part of the cutthroat that produce naturally too I don't have my fingers on that now but uh, but it, it was uh, it wasn't quite as high as the kokanee but it was somewhere around 30 to 40 in some years and it was pretty gratifying to walk those streams in the you know in the summer and see those little you know cutthroat fry swimming around up some of those streams some of the little you know, small streams like uh, Chipman had fish in it. <laughs> it's just amazing sometimes. But again, we've got uh, with the drought conditions, especially for the kokanee. You know, there's not much water there in the fall anymore, and it's uh, you know we, we need some rain <laughs> and snow. Any other questions? Yes. Do you find that the feeding schedules for all the three kinds of fish are the same or for different better? I'm sorry, I hear pretty poorly. Okay. The feeding schedules for like the three different kinds of fish that you talked about are the same, or they're better times of day for the different Well, you know, as I said, kokanee are they're pretty much largely taken between May and mid to late August. That, that goes into September a little bit. A few take in the winter. Rainbows uh, are taken year long. Are you talking time of day? Time of day. Time of day. Time of day. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, uh, it's the same as any other water. You know, early in the morning is great. Especially in the summer, I mean, if uh, a lot of the guys that are going after cutthroat in the summer, they go up there, you know, well before the sun comes up. And even if, I've seen ice fishermen, I've seen them departing <laughs> when I'm coming in late in the day. And they're going out on the ice at, at you know, 8 o'clock at night. <laughs> and they spend the whole night on the ice. And, you know, I, I think it's the same as anywhere, you know, that the, the, you know, the per, uh, crepuscular hours are great. Nighttime fishing is pretty good. And, you know, but uh, I think uh, rainbows, I've, I've seen, I think rainbow morning fishing is the best too. I've seen some take in the middle of the day, but it's uh, not as, not quite as good. I spent a summer up at Strawberry and I think it was 2018, 19. That's when it was really good. <laughs> but um, the lunar calendar, within an hour. Even in the middle of the day, whatever the 
made your time is on the lunar calendar. Do you know what we're talking about? Yeah. Right. We do include the lunar calendar every month in our newsletter if you're if you're a club member, so that does go out every month. Yeah, that lunar calendar for Kokanee is within, you know, I'll within bet, I'll bet it's a week, but I spend the whole summer up there. And I, I go out at 2 30 in the afternoon, that's when the lunar's. Well, you know, they, there's a lot of anglers that swear by that, and I've never paid much attention. <laughs> Probably I should. Got to, that's when we would go out. It's an hour either way of the lunar, and we did really well. Well, that, that's, uh, you know, especially helpful if you're up there. You know, adjusting your schedule. I guess what you do is you adjust the schedule around the, the lunar. Okay, there you go. You tell your wife you're not available on these. <laughs> Any other questions? We're probably out of time. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Uh, and it might be a good idea if we turn off the lights now. Yeah. Um, glad everybody could come out tonight. Uh, our next speaker is Jace Johnson from uh, Shields, and he's uh, going to present some cooking uh, equipment hardware. <laughs> Thanks for having me. My name is Jace. Ironically, I actually don't work in the fishing department. I'm the hunting manager, but I uh, I fish way more than I hunt. Um, I probably like a lot of you love strawberry. I grew up in Vernal though, so strawberry was a couple hour drive. So living here, it's awesome because I can go fish it every weekend if I want now. Um, from what I've gathered, there's a lot more interest in kokanee. Is that about right? I mean, I only have a few minutes here, so if everybody's nodding, kokanee is kind of the what they're interested in. I think um, we'll kind of spend time on that. Um, everybody knows about the trolling forum and stuff, but let's talk kind of the newest, latest, greatest thing for them is jigging for them. Now, not everybody's set up to do that. It's kind of like jigging for any species. Your best if you have a trolling motor that's got spot lock or an anchor type setup to where you can stay over the spool once you find them. Um, I use trolling to find fish sometimes, but once I find those fish, I prefer to jig them just because I can jig fish way faster than I can troll. I, I don't have to let line out, drop my downrigger or run let in or anything like that. If I find a, a, a school that I can fire up, that's how I like to catch them. And obviously good electronics are key too. You gotta have electronics that you can differentiate a school of kokanee versus cutthroat or rainbows or something. And, the only way I can tell you to do that is by experience and then knowing kind of what water depth you're focusing on for that time of year, right? So early in the year, they're gonna be shallower. As the year goes on, they all go deeper. And trout do that too, but I look for tighter, dense, packed fish. That's what I'm looking for when I'm first looking for coconut. Usually the tr trout are kind of sporadic, but I'd love to see them on an underwater camera. I imagine something out of the ocean, like a bait ball or something. That's what I'm looking for when I'm first looking for, for kokanee. And then once I find them, I try to drop on them. I don't, I don't love to troll, like I'll be honest with you. Like I just, I would rather, I'm a bass guy. I like that reaction type bite. I like being active, jigging and stuff. So that's kind of what I, what I like to do. We ice fished for them all winter. So I brought a variety of different jigs and, and baits up here for it. Um, really it's all the same colors so your pinks your chartreuses your oranges sometimes straight silver sometimes a little bit of gold and primarily jigging spoons are going to be your number one but um some of the, some of these guys in here probably fish the jigging wraps from rapala for like your ice stuff i fish them a ton for kokanee and they get overlooked a lot what People, color what color um this is one of my favorites it's a i think they call it chartreuse shad it's almost like a clown color in a way too. So it's, it's got a pearl belly, chartreuse back. And is that just a ball a right? It is. Okay. Yeah, so I jig a lot with this. This is a size seven, it's a five eighths um, ounce. Most of the time I start at a half ounce and I go up from there depending on the depth that day. If they're in 50 foot of water, I'm probably gonna be closer to an ounce to an ounce and a half on my weight. Um, You'll know instantly because if you can't keep vertical on them, even with your spot lock, you need to go heavier. You need that line sitting perfectly straight underneath you so that you don't have a slight bow in your line and you're feeling that bite instantly, okay? Um, so I'll set a bunch of these up here. You guys are welcome to come find me afterwards or come up here and look. Um, this is also another odd one for jigging them that a lot of people probably haven't ever heard of. These are rattle traps, okay? These are the same colors, kind of that pink and green. 
but I do, well, I catch a lot of cutthroat too when I'm doing it with these, so sometimes I'll shy away from them if there's a lot of cuts mixed in with it. There's times where you can't keep the cuts off long enough to fire up the school to get to the, the cokes that are there with them. But um, yeah, these ripping baits, the same thing. You're, you're just ticking them off. You're just making them mad. It's, it's all about getting that first bite. And it seems like once you get those first couple bites, that's when you can trigger the whole school. So, um, but I'll set these up here. Uh, how many guys are set up to troll? Like, is that a huge interest as well? Kind of while we're talking about this? Yeah, a lot of you. So trolling the rod is critical. Um, this Before is you a, go there, what are you, what are you using as a rod for jig? Just a stand? Yeah, I know. Or what, what do you uh, use? This is just so, Coke can have super soft mounts. Most of you probably know that. Um, there's rubber snubbers and things like that that are literally like a suspension device for your line on your trolling rod so that you're not tearing your mouth. So you'll see a lot of guys. Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. So the, the a medium action rod is probably ideal, honestly, for like ounce and a half or um, heavy jigs, but I actually fish a medium light most of the time because it's got more tip to it. So I don't tear nearly as many mouths when I'm vertical jigging. And I, I fish this rod for my rainbows, I fish it for cuts. I usually take two or three medium light action rods that are my favorites. This happens to be one of the Shields rods. They're great for the money. Um, and then I usually always rig with braided line and fluorocarbon leader, just because it's very, very sensitive. And when I'm vertical jigging in 60 foot of water, 70 foot of water, it's all about filling that. And I like colored braid. I brought some fire line up here and it's chartreuse. And so I'm fishing probably 10 to 20 feet of fluorocarbon leader. But the big reason is, is I'm watching my line half the time because if that fish eats as I'm dropping, I'm watching for a slackness in my line, not necessarily feeling anything at that point. They can pick it up on the way down and I would never know it if I had a line that I couldn't see. So in a way, like most all of my rods, no matter what fish species I'm fishing for, I always have bright line that are like, and braid straight white. I can see well on the water because I I catch so many fish that I would have never felt, but I saw it in my line. So I highly recommend, and not not just braid. Like there's there's colored monofilaments for different things. Like and then I'll just tie a leader on um, if I'm you know worried about fish being line finicky. Which definitely with kokanee and most trout species, I'm always fishing a leader of some sort. So you just um, watch your bait on your fish finder so you know where you're at. There's no counter on that. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, no counter. So, um, yeah, the key is, is good electronics, being able to stay in one place, keep your bait under your transducer, and get down to that right depth. If I have people fishing with me, a lot of times the bottom's only another 10 or 20 feet below. So I'll have them drop. I'll drop to bottom and then I'll count up. Okay, I'm five and a half cranks from bottom. So I can tell people that are in my boat with me, like, drop to bottom five and a half cranks up and start fishing there, you know, and then at least get some on. So you, you don't have to have perfect, but it, it definitely helps to have a fish finder that you can see a jig in 60, 70 foot of water if you need to on that particular day. Um, trolling wise, so most all of your trolling rods that are kokanee specific are super slow action noodley, and that's to prevent that tear out on the mouths. And then also those big dodgers have such a big sweeping action that rod tip is a, kind of takes some of that up um, and it almost gives that bait even more action because it doesn't have such a rigid point that it's pivoting off of, if that makes sense. Um, so like this is a llama glass, there's a million different, especially here in Utah, we've got several local companies making these really slow action trolling rods. And then this is just a Okuma level wind. It's actually one of the Shills Outfitter ones, but it's, it's an Okuma line counter is a must if you troll. Um, especially with lead line. The amount of lead you let out is going to control how depth that bait's going as well as the trolling speed, right? So you have to know how much you're letting out when you're starting to run leaded line. Um, and then we could spend an hour just on downriggers, but um, if you run the downrigger, you still want a line counter so you know you're letting 60 feet or 100 feet back and then sending it down on your cannonball to whatever depth you're fishing. Um, but we kind of talked about uh, the Dodgers and the short leaders, I usually fish anywhere from a foot to two foot is about the most. And I kind of let the fish tell me 
if I'm fishing shorter leaders and I'm getting absolutely nothing that day, it's probably because if the bait has too much action, they're a little bit more lethargic that day for whatever reason, I'll go longer because my squid's not gonna get nearly as much action, okay? Um, if you don't have any of these, keep your eye out for them. These are the gold maggots that everyone talks about. Every year the state runs out of them. I'm not kidding. I came from sportsman's, I worked there for years. We'd run out of them, Shields runs out of them. So buy them when you can find them. They're, they literally just say maggot on them. There's pink, There's I think there's orange, and I know there's the chartreuse color. I don't know that it matters too much on what color you're tipping with. It's more the scent than it is anything. And then squids and dodgers we could spend hours on, but it's the same basic colors every time. Pinks, oranges, uh, greens, and then a little bit of silver most of the time. And like, I just happened to grab these are from Max and from Rocky Mountain, but there's a million different and they all have different sizes. Some have bends to them. You'll, the guys that are really into this, I, if my wife knew how much I spent just on my daughters <laughs> alone, it would be bad, but yeah. I've got cases of them. And that's because yeah. you have to be willing to try a few different ones. If it's just me and I can only have my two rods illegal, I have a different one set on each rod until I can figure it out that day. But if I've got four guys in the boat, I'm gonna run two down the middle with something else, two on the sides, and maybe even if I've got my extra long rods, I might even run two more. So I've got six rods in my boat all at one time, running something different until something gets hit. And then it's like, okay, well that worked that time. Some days it doesn't matter. Some days they, 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 they're just aggressive. And other days you wanna pull your hair out because you can't figure them out. But um, having a little bit of variety, some different sizes. Most all of these will give you an idea on the back of them of what speed you should troll. And I, when I was first starting, like it's like, oh crap, that one will only go up to two mile an hour, but this one will do three. I would literally cut out this back card and just keep them with that dodger in my box so I knew. Um, but you can tell once you kind of have the eye for it, you put your rod tip in the water trolling that speed and you can see what you're kind of looking for with how that dodger actually moves in the water. But it's just an experience thing. Um, uh, I have lots of stuff in here for, for cutthroat and rainbows and that, but like we said, they're kind of, they're not, they're not necessarily easy, but they're easier than Cody for sure. Um, lots of examples of squid up here. Uh, my biggest piece of advice is make sure you're setting them, make sure you have three or four of the key colors and don't be afraid to change. If you know you're on fish and you're seeing them on your graph, you need to be changing until you find something that's working and and moving up and down in the speed you know anywhere from like when i say speed it's very sensitive we're talking the difference between one mile an hour and 1.4 mile an hour can be the difference that day and how much that dodger is actually moving so it can be um you'll see like big drift socks guys that they, they can't quite find adjust their throttle enough to to switch that so they'll throw a drift sock out of the back of their boat and drag that to get that perfect speed. So it's kind of like you were saying, like kokanee, you can't just kind of get into this if you really want to catch it. You know, you might, the guys that are good have all these tools and it's an investment at first, but once you have those tools, um, you can get on them any day and, and eventually figure them out as long as you're willing to, to try some new things and you just kind of roll with the punches. But um, this is another scent I use a lot of times and I'll just squirt some up in the top of my, um, squids so this one's called trout feast i'm it smells terrible i don't even know how to describe it but <laughs> it, it works it just sometimes um that over the maggot on certain days seems to be good i know guys that'll cut a little tiny piece of sponge and shove it up in their nose of their squids and then they'll run a little bit of that too just to to keep the scent with it more off more than if you were just squirting some in there and letting it run out, it's probably in 10 or 15 minutes, it's probably all gone if you aren't running this, the uh, sponge. So um, hopefully that helps a little bit. Um, make sure if you don't have trolling rods, the rubber snubbers, has everybody seen one of those before? Kind of know what I'm talking about. It's literally surgical tubing and it's got a piece of heavy braid um, inside of it. So they'll stretch a certain amount and then that braid will, will get tight. Um, if you don't have trolling rods or you don't want to invest the money in those, but you have a bunch of nice trolling rods you already like, you can buy those rubber snubbers and you just run them above your dodger three or four feet 
And I mean, it's quite the setup you've got by the time you got your rubber snubber in there, your dodger and your squid, you know, it's a, it's a big long setup. But like I say, to do it the right way, you, you'll tear so many fish mouths if you don't have a really soft rod or you don't have rubber snubbers. It gets frustrating. It's like, oh, cool, we got one. And then it comes off and you're like, well, that was awesome. So one thing about the snubbers is they don't last over the years. You probably they, have to place them they rot. They're, like, they break after a year. Yeah, they they rot. It's just typical. It's like a rubber band. They eventually rot. Maybe a couple couple years is pushing it. Most of the time you'll notice they start to get brittle or they're a lot stiffer than what they once were when you got them new. So, but yeah, it's it's a must. Most people already have nice trolling rods, so we sell a ton of those just because they're they want to adapt their standard level wind and trolling rod to a kokanee type setup. You know, like a medium action trolling rod and like that seven foot range will work with the rubber snubber. But if you really get into it, they're not expensive. You, you know, 40, 50 bucks, you can get into some of these kokanee rods that are just fine. So but hopefully that helps a little bit. Does anybody have any other questions or? Everybody always asks, where do you fish for kokanee? I go to Renegade most of the time and I head towards the Narrows and I just watch my graph. A lot of times it's a long idle, but I'll idle clear across that sucker and I'm just watching my graph until I see them. And uh, I usually anchor up on, I like the jigs, most of the time I'm jigging. Um, if I'm idling out there, I'll usually troll for, you know, half a mile or whatever out there until I find them and maybe I'll get one or two and get lucky. But I like to jig. That's my favorite way to catch them through the ice. Um, you can do just as good, but the problem is it's a lot harder to be mobile ice fishing. So it's like they're either there or they're not. And I don't, I don't run all over trying to find them, but I used to always have some stuff set up to fish for cokes. So, but yeah, hopefully it helps. Any anybody have questions or anything specific? There's uh, I, one thing I did talk about were these jigging spoons. Um, they're called coconators. If you guys want to come look at them, they're up here. P Line makes them. They're probably, I'd say, the best jigging spoon period for coconut. They just have it dialed on the colors. So you guys can come up here, look at them. I'll hang around if anybody has questions or anything. So, cool. All right. Um, a little bit of club business. Uh, and there's a lot of new people here. Thank you so much. We're really glad you're here. Um, the, the, you know, the elected officers of the club, it's called the e-board. Uh, e-board members and anybody who wants, uh, wants to, if you want to uh, meet with us right after, there'll be a really quick huddle for the e-board afterwards. And Dale is our acting treasurer. Dale, I was going to suggest that maybe we just give your financial report at the e-board after We'll, we'll talk finances with you at the e-board after, okay? Got you. Um, next month's meeting is, uh, you know, Lee, it is... That's a, Willard Bay and uh, uh, Manway. Okay. And, and then the week after that is going to be a special one on techniques of trolling for Kokini and salmon. Like the month after that. Yeah. So the main meeting, uh, again, the topic is going to be Willard Bay and Mattaway. The other thing that we do as a club is um, try to get out and try to fish together. In May, um, probably the Saturday after the meeting, we will be, and again, this is pre-Memorial Day, um, we're going to have a, a potluck picnic up there. So on the Saturday, we will uh, head on up there, fish for everything that's in the lake that we can fish for. Uh, and then probably about two, three in the afternoon, we'll have a uh, barbecue. Uh, you know, hot dogs, hamburgers, chip salad, drinks, and y'all are welcome to come along. We'll, we'll, that'll be some of the information. They'll be coming on out in the, uh, in the newsletter. But uh, if you're new to walleye fishing, Willard Bay in May is usually pretty good, and that's also the time that the crappie are starting to set up on their beds, and crappie fishing is usually improved. So, um, another just a little bit of background information. We have been primarily uh, focused on walleye in the past, 
we love to fish for everything. It's always been a multi-species club since its founding in, the, in 1989. Um, and we, in the past years, have done like intra-club, just within the club, tournaments. Uh, usually on the weekend following the club meeting, and we'd all gather at one lake or another and, and, and compete against each other. And it was a lot of fun, but we found that that tended to be the whole focus. And it was a small group of people. Sometimes we'd end up with only like three or four boats in a, in a tournament. And uh, we decided this year to do something a little different. And Mike Manning will be talking about it in just a moment. But what we're trying to do is get out and fish with new people. Um, so we're going to do uh, a little bit of anybody who wants to come fishing with us, we're going to ask for volunteers or those that have boats, primarily probably club members. We've also had some interest expressed after the walleye seminar last, uh, last month that there might be people who would like to fish for walleye but would like to have somebody that's fish for walleye go with them on their boat. Mm -hmm. So that's the sort of thing that we're going to try to pair people up together. We ask your patience because this is a new drill for us. It's something new that we're trying to experiment with so that we can get out and fish. Um, we've always taken out guests during our tournaments when we do the tournaments. And the most fun I think I ever had was taking out people who are new to walleye fishing and putting them on walleye and, and having, uh, and usually it was the most fun when the wife outfished the husband. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> um, so again, keep an eye out for the uh, for the newsletter. If you are not getting the emails and the newsletter in your mail and you want it, there's a clipboard floating around somewhere. Please give us your email address and name. Please write legibly. <laughs> it's gonna be right back here. Please write very carefully in great big letters. Um, and the other thing is, uh, at this point, fishing reports. Who's been out? Where, where have you been and what have you done? We were up at Walleye or uh, Willard Bay last week and uh, didn't catch a theme. Uh, I've heard that Willard is a little slower this spring than usual. You're not the only one, man. Every, I think everybody's having trouble with Willard right now. Ben, who did our Walleye seminar, he's kind of his, that's his backyard and he's pretty frustrated. He's going to go up to Deer Creek this week because he's like, I can't stand it anymore. They're not, just not, nothing happened right now. So I, uh, I saw a really interesting uh, YouTube video that I think was on Deer Creek, and I'm going to try to pin down the guy if he'll share. But I think that uh, that he was evening and night fishing for walleye on Deer Creek, which at this time of year is really cold. <laughs> yeah. uh, it wasn't me personally, but if you guys are interested in walleye, I know Utah Lake has this vibe of being trash lake ugly water whatever but right now if you go and launch and go out and fish bird island or the harbors you will catch walleye fishing bottom yeah. with a curly tail grub or um i like stick baits personally digging digging them deep into the mud stick baits for walleye right now um i personally have a friend that caught three over eight pounds in a day uh, just a couple days ago. Yeah, we, so. yeah, we just saw a picture today of a uh, 30-inch walleye that was caught a couple of days ago. Um, I'm not sure exactly where on the lake it was caught, but uh, Utah Lake in the spring is, and in this time of year, actually, this is a little lake, lake. But if you can find them, if you can good. find them, I mean, right. again, Bird Island around uh, Lincoln Beach. Um, it's all a couple weeks behind this year too. I mean, this weather and stuff has got everything kind of in a funk right now. Yeah. So walleye should be almost. Not, I would say they're kind of on their downhill slope by now usually, but from what everybody I've talked to, they're still they haven't seen that peak yet in them, and they're starting to finally get some fish shallow that are definitely acting like they're spawning. Which um, which is why we're really hopeful for yeah to get yeah group so, out and go fish Willard together and have a picnic. Yeah, and hopefully not get snowed on. So <laughs> May, May we ought to be okay. Yeah. I've seen it snow in May. Yeah. <laughs> no, and, and we've had... Uh, this is the year we could use it. We, yeah, we've had some really intense weather on Willard Bay uh, when we've been out there as well. Um, Mike, you are, yeah, Badger, you want to talk about pairing people up or you want to do that very last? 
Um, the drawing? Let's do the drawing for anybody okay. who wants to do the drawing, and then afterward we'll do what's called a hookup, and then we'll kind of connect people. Did everybody get a ticket yet? Anybody else? One, two. Why he's doing that? I, I had to put some new numbers on my boat. I don't know if anybody else needs new numbers, but they give you a whole heap of them. Yeah. I just got brand new ones, so if you need new numbers, you can grab oh, those. Number right there. Um, and I also got a case of those pink maggots. So if you need one, you can come talk to me. We can we can talk about what arm you have to get. All the If he wins, we are you lose. Both you. For the last seven, eight years, I take out handicapped and special need kids on a pontoon boat. And uh, the name, uh, you might have seen my boat at Deer Creek because they let me keep it there. DNR lets me keep it there because I do that. And um, I, I, I like to take out uh, them with their friends or family. I don't charge a thing. Uh, I can get rainbows. You gotta get rainbows at Deer Creek. And so if anybody uh, knows someone in a wheelchair, handicap, or special needs, but especially I need a parent or somebody to be with them. And I can do a 30-inch wheelchair, so. Anyway, uh, get a card if you know somebody that likes to fish, and I'll show them a good time. Okay, thanks, Roger. Um, would you please uh, draw our numbers for us tonight. It wasn't my card, I guess. Oh, you know what? I, I didn't go on in for me. If I win, uh, everybody go in a tax kit. <laughs> don't pick that one. Yeah, don't pick that one. You're going to put up price so we can look. Uh, actually, just, you know, whatever you want. First of all, we've got three $10 gift cards. By the way, Shields has been incredibly generous in the support of Rockland and Anglers. We really appreciate it. So we've got three ten dollar gift cards. So let's pull out three numbers. Four four nine nine three six. Nine three six. Let's keep them rolling. All right. Four four nine nine three two. Oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, yell out one more. Four four nine nine two four. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, we've got an Alamo. No, it's a Plano. A Plano uh, tackle gearbox. Uh, it was like for. Uh, Oh, these are, these are nice. Squids, other things that you're going to be taking. Plastics are great. Plastics are good. Plastics are good. All right. I'm going to skip the first three numbers. They're all the same. 939. Thank you. All right. Uh, we've got a really nice net. That's a very nice net. There's a big one that. Wow. 930. And uh, I think the grand prize tonight is a uh, electric fillet knife. Oh, wow. Nice. Full timer electric fillet knife. Uh, awesome. I put my ticket down. That's fine. Please, please. 928. Oh, <laughs> All right, Mike, we're going to have Badger. We'll turn the time over to you to try to arrange it. Okay. <laughs> so I put, I, I'm the guy who puts up. That's it. We're good. Thanks. I'm the guy who puts up the newsletter. So if you, if you have mission reports or if you have pictures, uh, pictures are always, everybody likes pictures because you can tell me you've got a fish, but I need to see it. <laughs> um, that's my email right there. You can email me and we'll make sure to get on there. You can also, if you also take that, sometimes it's hard to read the, the email address and make sure that you get on our on our email list. Or even if you just have questions, sometimes I can answer them for you. Um, that's my email right here, but we're, we're going to do a hookup right now. And 
I think this time, since it's brand new and we have a lot of new people, we're not going to limit it to club members, but typically what we'll do in the future is this is going to be kind of a member, if you're a club member, just a little bit about what a club member is. We only, we only ask $30 a year and that goes, helps towards, uh, we donate towards Camp Hobie, which, which helps un, uh, kids who have um, terminal illnesses and, and it helps their families. We, we donate to that every year. We also help donate towards uh, sending some people to starvation or to uh, the starvation classic. And we also use it for our, our club operations and things like that. And, and what you get is you get to be part of the newsletter, you get to help with those things, and then you also get to be uh, part of this hookup part. So what we'll do this time is even if you're not in the club, we can do this. And if, if you have a boat, if I can come get uh, your information, and we'll hook you up with some people who want to be on a boat but don't have a boat. Um, also let us know if you need help learning. If you want to have someone on your boat who's helping learning, we can probably find someone in the club uh, who even if they have a boat might come on a boat with you. So if you're interested in that, uh, feel free to come up. Otherwise, Shields would love you to walk through their fishing section and pick up any of this stuff, I'm sure. Um, we usually do pretty well after forums, so. But uh, yeah, if you're interested, come on up and we'll see what we can do. We're gonna, we're gonna iron this process out, but this is the first shot. Yeah. <laughs>